This is going to introduce Marx's theory of the determination of profit rates and compare the theory with what happened in the late 19th century to British profit rates with a statistical account. Marx starts with a simple numerical example in Capital 3, Chapter 13. He assumes that the level of wages and the length of the working day are fixed. Under these circumstances, a given sum of money being paid each week in wages can stand as an index or an alias for the number of workers employed. Thus, if the wage is a pound a week and a hundred pounds then represents a workforce of a hundred people, he goes on to make a simplifying assumption that the value created by labour will be divided equally between labour and capital. So that the total value created per week will be £200. And in his terminology, this means that the rate of surplus value, S prime, equal to S over V, is 100 over 100 or 100%. The rate of surplus value could, however, express itself in very different profit rates depending on the total amount of capital employed. And he designates this with the capital letter C, such that the capital C equals small c for constant capital plus variable capital V. The components being variable capital, which denotes wages, um, with C, small c being what he calls constant capital which is raw materials, buildings, machinery etc. And he gives the rate of profit p prime as the surplus divided by the total capital. That is to say s over c. And he illustrates this with a table of examples and in all cases he assumes s is 100. So he starts off with C being small c being 50 and gets a profit rate of 67 percent and he in steps increases the number for small c and gradually the profit rate falls. So what does this mean? It means as the ratio of v to c falls the rate of profit falls and this is if you haven't read Marx, it's a non-obvious relationship. Not obvious that this should ha happen. It follows directly from the labour theory of value, but wouldn't be obvious otherwise. You can, in principle, derive it from an assumption that the wage share in value added is relatively constant, but that amounts to an implicit acceptance of the labour theory of value. It should be noted that the figures that Marx gives are actually very high as rates of profits because he gives a time period of one week. You might think 50% is unrealistic, maybe 20% is, is within the bounds of possibility. But the fact is that Marx assumes £100 represents a week's expenditure on labour power and a profit rate of 20% a week is an astronomical profit rate per annum of over 1 million percent, which is obviously unrealistic. This shows that when you come to calculate practical examples, you have to be very careful about the time period you def you're calculating it over. It's all very well for simple proofs of principle to be done the way Marx does. But when you start applying it to real data, you have to be more careful. Note there's nothing in his example which depends itself on time. There's no saying that the different rows in the table occur at different time periods. The table could as easily be used to show that industries with a high organic composition of capital must experience a lower rate of profit, which we now know is in fact the case, as you can see in the next slide. Here I have plotted the rates of profit for 
about 80 different British industries um, correlated against the C to B ratio. And you can see that there's an inverse relationship. Industries with a, a large amount of C relative to V, note this is a log scale, a large amount of C relative to V have a low rate of profit and those with a small amount of capital relative to wages have a high rate of profit. And since it's a log-log scale, you, you'd expect Marx's um, relationship to show up as roughly a, a straight line relationship, allowing for the noise of uh, a ran semi-random scatter, that's exactly what happens. QED, you might say. That's what we wanted to prove, but not quite. Marx himself was blocked from making this interpretation of his table because he had, in an earlier chapter, chapter 10, hypothesized that the rate of profit in different industries would tend to equalize. This was the famous transformation argument, according to which labor values would be transformed into profit equalizing production prices. This is what modern historians of science call an epicycle in the theory. And we now know this epicycle is unnecessary. Empirical data shows that. But in Marx's favourite has to be said, he didn't have modern input-output tables to check his hypothesis, and it actually took until the 1980s before Marx's economists bothered to actually check it using I.O. tables. The point is that science can't advance beyond available data. There's a limit to what you can do with what's called the method of imminent critique. Because an imminent critique in the end can't get you beyond what was known by the people you were critiquing. The imminent critique can only reveal weaknesses in their logic. But nevertheless, the inverse relationship between profit and C over V actually validates the labour theory of value. So now let's look at how time comes into it. Marx saw his relationship between C over V and S over C as applying over a, a time period. Was he correct? Well, if we look at the actual evolution of the organic composition, that is to say C over V, and the rate of profit in Edwardian and Victorian Britain over the period immediately before to well after he was writing, you see that there is in fact a negative correlation of 61% between the organic composition and rate of profit. You can see that when the organic composition rises, the rate of profit tends to fall. When the organic composition falls, the rate of profit tends to rise. I've computed this fresh from the very useful database published by the Bank of England, a millennium of economic data. Now, the inverse relationship holds. That's the important thing to learn here. His basic formula an inverse relationship is validated both in cross-sectional terms across different industries and as time series data and I've, I've chosen the period he was writing in to illustrate this. There are some ambiguities about what is meant by capital and or constant capital and why it should be assumed it will rise. This is what he said. Now we have seen that it's a law of capitalist production that its development is attended by a relative decrease in variable in relation to constant capital and constant, consequently to the total capital set in motion. This is just another way of saying that owing to the distinctive methods of production developed in the capitalist system, the same number of labourers, i.e. the same quantity of labour power, is set in motion by a variable capital of a given value these people operate, work up and productively consume in the same time span an ever-increasing quantity of means of labour, machinery and fixed capital of all sorts, 
Ronald Zellery materials and consequently a constant capital of ever increasing value. That's the basic thing that he had seen happening in the Industrial Revolution. More constant capital was being employed per worker. But if we look at the trend that I showed earlier, in the figure of organic composition we don't see much of a constant rise after he was writing. He was writing in the mid 1860s and there's a bit of a rise up until 1880 and then it tends to decline. Declined until about 1900 then a bit of a rise again. So there wasn't the long-term rise that he was expecting on the basis of his observations of the Industrial Revolution up to 1860. Now in part what he was saying about workers setting in motion a larger mass of machinery ceased to, to apply. Particularly in sources of mechanical power machines got smaller. On the left is the steam engine which was designed in the 1880s to operate Tower Bridge in London. 25 years later steam engines have been replaced by steam turbines. There is a uh, the steam turbine on the right is one in a Prague museum and it was twice as powerful as the steam engine on the left. In terms of actual mass it's got much smaller and if you look at the the device on the right there it is actually a, a generator as well as a turbine so essentially the only maybe this part of it counts as the turbine so and this is a stand that someone could stand at and read so a person would be about that high and you can see the height of a person against the older steam engine it's much more compact and more powerful and this was something that was taking place in the late 19th century. Machines were being made more compact and more powerful. So how are we to measure this statement about an ever-increasing quantity of the means of labour? Do we measure it in tons? Well for some things that's perfectly reasonable. On the left is a typical cargo ship just after Marx's writing, 1870, a ship launched in 1870. Uh, uh, taken from the database of time built ships. On the right is a ship launched, a typical cargo ship launched on the Clyde in 1900, 30 years later. Now, the, the first ship, the steamship, was just over uh, 1200 tons. The ship on the right, 4,000 tons. This is the type of shift in scale which had occurred over 30 years. Steamships started small and got ever bigger. And 120 years later, cargo ships are absolutely enormous. Now, that's physical size. What about cost? Could a a ship owner have bought a vessel like the Cheviot in 1870, the Cheviot's the ship on the left, and used it for 30 years and then with the depreciation money set aside could he have bought a larger vessel like the Ernest Vorman um, which was actually built on the Clyde for a German shipping line for services to West Africa. Um, could he have bought that in 1900? Well if the productivity in the steel and shipbuilding industries had grown at say 4% a year, he could after 30 years buy a ship that is now 4,000 tons for the same price as a ship that was 1,200 tons before. In fact the growth and productivity was a bit less. Between the 1860s and the 1890s the price of British iron ships declined about 40%. The fall in iron prices and the improvements in building technology were of approximately equal influence in explaining the price decline, whilst rising wages offset about half their combined effect. I'm getting that from Harley.
This amounts to a fall in the, co price in the cost of constant capital for the shipping industry of about 1.7% a year. Now, if we look at the figures I showed in the graph earlier, between 1865 and 1895, the organic composition of capital in Britain fell at an average rate of 1.4% a year. If the general rise in productivity in what Marx called Department 1 of the economy, that producing means of production, was the same as that in shipbuilding, then it was more than sufficient to account for the decline in the organic composition of capital. This possibility was allowed for by Marx. He says, everything said in part one of this book about factors which raise the rate of profit while the rate of surplus value remains the same, or regardless of the rate of surplus value belongs here. Hence, also with respect to the total capital, that the value of constant capital does not increase in the same proportion as its material volume. He was aware of this. In short, the same development which increases the mass of constant capital in relation to the variable reduces the value of its elements as a result of the increased productivity of labour and therefore prevents the value of constant capital, although it constantly increases, from increasing at the same rate as its material volume i.e. the material volume of the means of production set in motion by the same amount of labour power. In isolated cases, the mass of elements of constant capital may even increase while its value remains the same or falls. So he was saying it can be the case that the value of the constant capital may fall per worker. So what summary can we have? Take into account the proviso that I showed in the italics. The overall account given in chapters 13 and 14 of Capital Volume 3 turn out to be consistent with what actually happened to the British economy in the latter part of Marx's life. What he got right was the inverse relationship between organic composition and profitability and he gives an account of how the organic composition of capital can fall and the technical composition rise as was the case in the late 19th century because of a steady rise in productivity in what he calls department one. Sources I used were Haley on the British ship building and merchant shipping and Karl Marx's capital.